Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. He said, I've only seen two drivers in my life that I think drive as good as you drive, and both of them in Formula One. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Lake, I didn't know this until I started putting together questions for this interview, but your dad was actually the mayor of Jackson, <laughs> Mississippi. Yeah, one term he was. Okay. What was, like, what was life like for you growing up? Oh, now that's a big question, and we've got a lot of time, so let's, <laughs> let's put it this way. Okay. Dad, you got to back up. When Dad was 18 years old, he was one of uh, eight kids, I think. It was seven boys. South Mississippi, he said, I was barefoot plowing a mule when I was 18 years old. He said, I looked around and I saw nobody in our families around here was really making much of themselves doing anything. And he said, I decided I was going to leave and go to the big city. And the big city was Jackson. Yeah. And uh, he went there and over a period of time, he wound up getting a job uh, working for a bank, you know, as a teller, I think. And uh, then the Depression came along. First of all, you remember, he was born in 1899. Your dad was eighteen. Okay, wow. Okay, He's forty-nine years old when I was born. <laughs> I was a oops. It came along <laughs> after the family had yeah, been established. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the closest one to me is eight years older than I am. <laughs> and my oldest brother is sixteen years older than I am. Wow. Okay. So, and then I've got a sister who's ten. Is ten years older than I am. So anyway, he comes to the big town, gets him a job. Depression comes along. The bank closes up, and they don't know what they're going to do, yeah. you know, and uh, some people that had known him through the bank, just banking with him, whatever, and encouraged him to start his own business. And back in those days, the stock market wasn't a big deal. What was the big deal was, was a bond business. They sold bonds for everything, and that's where institutions and people that had some money that wanted to invest it or whatever, they bought bonds. And it was for highway projects or any kind of stuff like that. So they all encouraged him to do that. And uh, he wound up starting out doing that and uh, being successful with it. And he was, because of the people that he was doing business with was the movers and shakers in the state, uh, they encouraged him to run for office. And so he ran for office. Uh, and I guess he'd gotten to be the mayor. He did that one term. And then they were asked him to off, run for office for state office or whatever. They ran for it and didn't make it. But uh, that was a political, it was kind of a short lived deal. But he was involved with. Uh, a lot of different people in, in the state and different companies and whatever like that. So that gave him a foothold, if you want to call it. I asked him one day, uh, Dad, how come you don't have any hobbies? You don't hunt or fish or do anything? He said, oh, son, you're wrong. You're wrong. My hobby is going down Capitol Street. I hunt and I fish. And I do all those things you're talking about, and I am really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Business was his hobby. Yeah. That's yeah. what it was okay. all about. It was, yeah. And they loved helping people and doing things for people and doing everything else. But on the downside for me, one thing being uh, oops and way later, and he's you know quite a bit older, when I got to be 10, 12, whatever like that, uh, I didn't see much of him because he was gone. He was at the office, you know, and he'd come in in the evening and eat and sit on the couch and read the paper and then go to bed early because he'd get up early right. and be yeah. gone again. So I didn't have a very close relationship with my father. He had a strong influence on me as to the work ethic and uh, just and appreciating people. And, you know, he was always told me, he said, don't ever burn a bridge because – Believe me, one day you'll need to cross it again. 
<laughs> you know, he gave us That's good a advice. lot of yeah. wisdom, a yeah. lot of wisdom. Man was just wise beyond all comprehension. Only had an eighth grade education, but had a brilliant uh, mathematical mind. I mean, a lot of the things that, like, uh, what it, loan, uh, what do you call it, things, amortization schedules. He had all that in his head before they ever designed it. Wow. Before anybody ever came up okay. with it. Okay, yeah. He could, you tell him an interest rate, and he could tell you what the payment's going to be. <laughs> Straight up, you know, all yeah, the way yeah. through. It was just, he was in, had an incredible mathematical mind. But uh, my oldest brother says he's trying to write a book on all the Pappy says, <laughs> all the, the wisdom yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. So that, that's the kind of guy he was. So, But he was, he, not only did he do the bond business, but he went out and bought some property, a lot of property, way outside of town and built a house out there. And then people wanted to come visit. Some friends would come visit. They said, man, we like this out here. We want you to sell us some property. So it wound up turning into a subdivision, a big subdivision for yeah. us all said and done. It lasted, you know, 35 years or something it took to for the to do the whole thing. But during that time, he hired people to build the roads and put all the stuff in and everything. He didn't go to a construction company. He just started one. And I spent most of my life with guys that worked for him when I was little, before I started school. I'd ride in a pickup truck with the foreman, wherever it was. I was on heavy equipment, just around tractors and cows and pigs and just whatever. It was kind of a farm out there where we were. So I, I really grew up basically on a farm that was had heavy equipment with it as well and was around all that stuff. You know, I was my thrill of my life was to go to the international f- Harvester place and get on the biggest tractor they got, you know, <laughs> showroom and stuff. And yeah, yeah, dream about yeah, it, you know, yeah, dream about stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, so first thing I ever drove was a John Deere tractor. You know, that was <laughs> the yeah. first thing I ever drove yeah. by myself, and I had to sneak off and do that. <laughs> you know? Now, how did carding come about, and what was your family's reaction when that started? Uh, very interesting there too. But by the time I was probably eleven or twelve years old. One Christmas morning, uh, heard this loud racket outside and ran outside to see what it was. And the guy that lived in the neighborhood further way over had gotten a competition racing go-kart for Christmas. Had a McCullough engine on it, you know, and a straight header. Oh, okay. That thing made a lot of racket. <laughs> he comes sailing down the street, yeah. that thing, and I'm thinking, hmm. This looks really interesting. Uh, <laughs> All I had was a bicycle and a Shetland pony. <laughs> <laughs> You'd hit the jackpot, but you still wanted more, huh? I said, man, this is, this is, I'll, I'll look into this. I looked yeah. into it and talked to my folks, and uh, they wouldn't buy me a race and go kart at that time. They, they got me a yard cart, you know, yeah. just with knobby tires on it. And so it didn't take long, but my mother changed her mind on that because I've, Made this big dirt oval in her front yard, <laughs> cut all the grass, you know, ate off yeah. all the grass and yeah. everything. She said, "This has got to go. You got to quit this." Yeah. And I was like, "Well, you need to get me a racing cart. I need a racing cart." So they they helped me with the first cart that I got. She, my mother, was a very compliant mother that <laughs> wanted to help the baby. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you were the she baby of the family. Baby. So she got me got me a cart. You know, she got me the first cart and. Uh, Dad took me to my first race that I ever went to. That was the only race he did. He never saw me race anything again after that one race. No kidding. He thought, he said, this is just total foolishness. You're wasting your time doing this stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, I had my brother was eight years older than me. He had a little compassion on me, and he'd take me to some of the events after, you know, around. The part, bad part was the closest. After that one race I went to, they closed the track. Yeah. The cart club that was had been running it closed down. Everything just dried up in, in the state of Mississippi. I had to go to Memphis or over in Alabama or somewhere to race. So I didn't get to race very much, but my brother would take me for a while there until I got old enough to get my driver's license, and then I started driving all over the country. It was crazy back then. Now, you went on to win six International Karting Federation champ- national championships, and in 1978, you became the first American ever to take the karting world 
championship. In 2008, I won another national championship in karting. In 2008? Yep. (laughs) (laughs) You were the man. Seven now. Now, They wonder, what's this old guy? (laughs) (laughs) Now, how old was your competition? Uh, Most of the competition at that time in 2008 in the series I was running was a road race series. We ran it. Atlanta Motor Speed, you know, uh, Atlanta and what's this place, VR, uh-huh. all the big race tra- oh, road course okay. racing yeah. tracks. Yeah. They run the carts on those, and that's what it was. So the, most of the guys are probably in their oh, 20s to maybe the oldest one might have been 40 years old, something like that, 35. But Just for the record, how old were you in 2008? Well, take away, I'm 72 now. Back it up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, now, back at, there. back in the late 70s, in 1978, I, I guess the big guy that you probably raced against at that time was Ayrton Senna. Yeah. Was that somebody that you actually knew, or was he basically just another face in the crowd? No, you know, that was the sixth year I went over there. Okay. The first year I went over was in, in 73, and I uh, couldn't even make the main event. Uh, just we were just totally outclassed right. equipment was european style american equipment just didn't really mesh well with the style of racing that they did and the rules that they ran under and so i went back came back home and uh started adapting everything i was doing to european style stuff i just said i don't care if i win another race here in the states i want to go back over there and okay redeem yeah. myself because yeah. when yeah. I went over there, I went over there as cocky as I could be. I'd won most every race I'd gone to yeah. that year yeah. here yeah. in the States. And I thought I'm gonna go over and clean these guys' clocks too. And man, they embarrassed me, you know, and so we changed over all of our stuff to European style things and I ran the next five years. Uh the next year I think I finished like twelfth or fourteenth or something like that. And overall then the next year, like six, then a fifth, and a six. Okay. Then I won. Wow. But uh, the Europeans, the Italians in particular, but there was a one guy from England that was always at the front every year in the World Championships, and a guy from from uh, I think he was Austria. He had won five world championships. This guy was the man. He was like Richard Petty or something yeah. over there, you yeah. know, for for the karting thing. Uh, so there was, I was focused mostly on the attack. Most of all the carts and the and the engines were all built in Italy, and they all had factory teams with paid drivers to race for them. So those were the guys that won most of the races. And I didn't know anything about anybody from Brazil or any of this other stuff. I was focused on the guys that were there. So when I didn't know anything about Senna's background or okay. nothing, nothing yeah. you know, he was just another guy out there to outrun, you know. But uh, he went on and did really well. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you did win that world championship, after having gone over there before, what was that moment like for you? Top of the mountain, top of the mountain. When it's the event, you got to understand the event was uh, Olympics. There's right. over a hundred drivers from I think the year I won. I think it was 27 countries represented. Wow. Uh, I was the only American there that year. It was a couple of years back. There was two guys. Another guy dr- raced one time. He was to go with me every year. And he raced, but then he realized he was just too big. He just weighed too much and couldn't do it. But he continued to work, go with me every year and help me. And then one year, there was a whole lot of the American drivers that, that ran really good here. They took their American equipment over there, and they didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but that was the only time they went, and nobody else came back again. But having won the national championship, so many national championships – and then to finally get to the very top, once I realized how hard it was going to be and how the odds of me winning were slim and none, even though I'd been going and finishing in the top ten you know, virtually every year after that. The guy that runs the whole thing, like the Jim France Jr. or the 
Bernie Ecclestone or whatever yeah. and everything. When I won the race, he said, I can't believe it. A dead gum tourist has won the world <laughs> championship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was out of fun. I mean, he was oh, yeah. he was a yeah. big supporter. He okay. was, that year uh, was his year that my first wife decided she didn't want to be married to me anymore and had left me and broke the news to me a few months before the World Championships, and I was blindsided and shook me to the ground. You know, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I actually, I called him and told him I wasn't coming that year. Yeah. And... Uh, Funny thing, it happened the year before, uh, my oldest brother had never seen me race a go-kart. Him and his wife just happened to be vacationing in Italy that same week that they had the World Championships. He was in Venice, and they drove over and watched me run, I think I finished fifth or sixth, I remember one or the other that year. And uh, when he heard that I was not going back, and he knew about the divorce thing and all this stuff. He said, Lake, you got to go. Yeah. You need to go. Yeah. Get all this other out of your mind. He said, you just need to go do this. So I called him back up to call the factories. that it, I, I, I imported and sold their products over here. And I called him out and said, I changed my mind. I think I'm going to come anyway. And the guy said, well, we've... We're not really prepared for you, but come on anyway. We'll we'll get we'll get your equipment for you, and uh, so I went back over and won the darn thing. And that's the year you won. That's the year I won. Wow, that's an awesome story. Now, according to your bio on Wikipedia, you actually considered Formula One, CART, IMSA. Uh, how seriously were you looking at those other divisions, and how did you wind up deciding to move to NASCAR? Yeah, this is a good story too. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> you have to understand, in those six years that I raced carts, there was probably six or eight drivers that I raced against in carts that in less than 24 months were driving Formula One cars and doing well. No kidding. Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay. I talked to one of them about two years I was about the third, fourth, about the fourth year I was over there. I thought one of them came to the Karting World Championships, and he was wandering around talking to everybody and everything. And I got to visit with him a little bit, and I said, well, what's a car like that feel like? He says, big go-kart. Okay. And I said, wow. So I come back home. I've lost my wife. I just won the World Championships. There's nothing else no goals left for karting. Spent all my life chasing goals, win races, championships, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. I really don't know what to do with myself. What I need is a goal that I can't reach. I need to shoot for the moon, but I don't want to live in Europe. It's a great place to visit, but I don't care anything about living over there. Boy, from Mississippi yeah, yeah. and Europe doesn't that way <laughs> So I said, well, maybe I'll just look at car racing in the States, the professional racing, and see see what I can do. And obviously, all of my background has been road racing. So that was the first place I went. And I realized real quick the top level was out of reach. That wasn't going to happen. And they had a series about that time that was, uh, I've forgotten what they called it. It was, you know, next tier down, I guess, from, from any cars. And... Went to a couple of those events and talked to some people, and uh, they were had a team that was really interested in putting me in a car and had contract ready to sign. And uh, I get a phone call from a total stranger, uh, happened to be the editor of it's either Car and Driver or Motor Trend, one of those two. I forget which. I think it's Car and Driver. He said, "Look, you don't know me, but." Uh, I've been watching your career and notice, you know, this year, 1978 was kind of a special year. Mario Andretti won the world championships. Kenny Roberts won the world championships. And Lake Speed won the world championships. Yeah. He said, "Uh, I understand you've been looking for going into professional racing. He said, I just want to suggest to you something. Before you make any decisions going road racing, you need to look at this NASCAR program because it's got the best future. And 
you know, you just need to look at it if you're willing to do that. And I said, well, yeah, I'd be looking at it. I don't know, but I don't know anybody or know anything about it, you yeah. know, at all. I I know Daryl Walter had raced go-karts a little bit one time, and that's about it. I don't know anything else. And he said, well, look, I've uh, got a guy that wants you to come up there, and they'll show you, take you to the track, introduce you around, show you people, and see whatever, and see if it's something that you want to do. Well, it turned out it was Humpy Wheeler. And uh, Humpy had uh, Daryl Derringer pick me up at the airport. Okay. Charlotte Airport back then was a building. <laughs> Didn't yeah. have it was a yeah. little old yeah. thing yeah. that yeah. was over there. You know, you had to get on stairs, pull it, pushed up to the plane. You know, <laughs> thing. Anyway, we got got off, and uh, Daryl's great guy, the ex driver from you know, did Goodyear testing, developing the inner shields and all that stuff. I think he won a race or two. Anyway, Daryl picks me up and takes me to Charlotte Motor Speedway and shows me around. I was highly impressed with there. And then they took me to Martinsville where the race was that weekend. So we go up to Martinsville and introduce me around to people. I talked to Ricky. I'd raced go-karts against him one time. He had raced one place. He, he did mostly road racing. I did mostly sprint racing. Ricky Rudd? Ricky Rudd okay. was there. So I went down and talked to Ricky a little bit. And he was telling me, yeah, this, you know, I kind of did the same thing, did karts. And then my family, brother and dad and all them, decided they wanted to go stock car racing so that's how we got here <laughs> but uh went put me in a press box you know introduced me to all the people up there and whatever and i watched the races from the press box and when it was all over with uh tell you how naive i was i said daryl i don't know about this going around a circle thing it didn't look to me like there was more than five or six guys down there that knew how to drive I didn't understand <laughs> about <laughs> chassis, yeah, yeah, shocks and sway bars and all that stuff. You didn't have all that stuff in go karts. You went and bought the top of the line cart, put a good motor on it, and drove the wheels off of it. And best driver won the race. I didn't realize there were probably a lot of really good drivers down there. His cars were junk. <laughs> you know, they just they just weren't handling good. You know. Now, know did you know it. anything at all about NASCAR at the time? Nothing. Really? Nothing. Okay. And I'd gone to local stock car tracks and yeah. watched local yeah. guys race. I'd actually, I don't remember, I think we were at a go-kart race up in, in the Nashville area and went to the track there in Nashville before, when it had those real high banks. I could, oh, yeah. That was yeah. the only time. I, yeah. I, I went there and watched the race there and just as a spectator. But that's that was it. That wow. was the only stock car I just didn't know anything about it. Now, in 19... 19- Let me tell you, though. Okay. Got to hear this part first. So, Daryl says, well, what do you think if we get, get you an opportunity to drive one of these things? You think it looks that easy? <laughs> and be boring. <laughs> Put up or shut up. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, that that would yeah. be maybe that that will get the trophy ready. Yeah, let's, 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 let's go do it." You know? <laughs> so they took me down to Rockingham. They got a deal with DK which had you know he was doing. Uh, he drive and he'd let people rent the car and yeah. go drive and everything. So they they worked at this deal and took me to Rockingham. In October, I think it was. It was nice and chilly and all that bare grease on that track. They took me and threw me in the fire. I went down there. Now, was this for a race or a test? No, this is a test. Just okay, a go test. test. Yeah. Let this Yahoo go out here and drive this. <laughs> so we get down there and uh, DK takes the car out and he goes around and runs around there, you know, warms it up and runs around and comes in and says, okay, get in and go. I said, no, 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 no. I don't have a clue what this is supposed to feel like. I said, I want to crawl in on the right side and just hold on, and you take it around there so I can get an idea, some idea of what I'm getting into, what this is supposed to do. So he took me running around there, and I said, okay, all right, now. So I get in the car, go out and run, come in. I said, man, you're doing great. You're doing awesome. I said, I'm thinking to myself. Yeah, I hadn't even run hard yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is—I hadn't even 
Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I'm just feeling this thing out. You were a little uppity, weren't oh, you? Man. <laughs> World champion. You got you got a lot of confidence. Yeah. I beat everybody that was beat. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I went out. I, I forgot to tell you one other thing, but it'll go. Uh, I'll finish this first. So I sail out there and mash the gas, and next thing I know, I've crashed that thing. I crashed it. Oh, big. okay. Destroyed yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, destroyed that thing. And uh, all bruised up and everything. I didn't know anything about seat belts and the fact you're supposed to have them really tight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. like passenger car, I just I'm going through it. But I decided right after that, I said, yeah, I think I've found a gold that I'll never be able to reach. Wow. I don't know anybody, don't know anything about it. I have no clue what I'm doing. Mountain. Yeah. Odds of me being successful here are zero, but I can join the struggle. Before the stock car thing came to be, I decided I was thinking big cars, you know, the road race cars. So I went to Jim Russell Driving School in Ontario, California. They put me in a like a form of Ford or whatever it was and uh, ran that thing. And it was like a slow go-kart. It was <laughs> so easy to drive. Yeah. It was just nothing. The instructor, I'd come in. They, they'd give you limits, RPM limits, and then they're timing you. And if you don't go over this RPM limit, I'd go out there and run, go way faster than they thought it was possible to go and come in and the, and the tack deal would still be below the limit. Wow. And they said, how can you do that? And we they kept raising the limit, kept raising the limit. And uh, I went faster than anybody ever been with the limit. Wow. And the guy says, I don't... He said, I've only seen two drivers in my life that I think drive as good as you drive. And both of them in Formula One. And uh, he said... You need to get in professional racing big time. And he wrote me a nice letter and whatever to introduce myself to people and whatever like that. So that was part of the confidence thing, right. too. Yeah. Is, yeah. You know, okay, yeah. I got to have a go-kart and I got in a bigger car and then then good things happened. So that was prior to the stock car thing. Now, I just happened to be on YouTube yesterday and I saw a video of the 1980 ARCA race at Daytona. And from the description of the video, <clears throat> you were leading on the last lap, and coming off turn four, they throw the green flag? Is under that... Under caution. Do what? This is under caution. Okay, yeah. You're leading under caution okay. on the last lap, come off turn four. I got a tape in my desk. You can hear it again if you want. And they... Th <laughs> And they actually throw the green flag coming off turn four on the last lap, and you're going to race to the finish line? Let me tell you how bad it was. I, you know, first time at Daytona. Uh, now, whose car were you in? I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, and you won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a car I bought. I, I didn't bought. mean to trigger you or anything. Oh, yeah, no, it's pretty, cool. it pretty cool. The... Uh, after after the Rockingham thing, uh -huh. I got to tell myself some more. We decided we were going to go race and did a deal with DK to take me to a race. And so we'd go to Atlanta. And I'd get out there and practice, and I'm running good enough to get in the race, you know, be fast enough to be in the race. And uh, when qualifying starts, I'm watching – I'm standing on top of the truck, and I'm watching – Buddy Baker, I remember his buddy. He went off in the first turn. Didn't look like he let out of the throttle till he got about halfway through between one and two. And went around, and he was quick as time at the time. I'm qualifying a little later, so I jumped down in the car. I said, Some guy, he can drive that thing down in there. I can, too. I ain't afraid. I drove that car off in the corner. It broke loose. <laughs> Started spinning before I ever lifted out of the top. <laughs> Spun the thing around, didn't hit anything. Yeah. 
aggravated. I mean, just, I don't know, stupid. I drive back towards the, going the wrong direction, go back towards the start finish line, do a UE and take it off because I knew I'd get two laps. I knew the first lap was no good. I'm going to get the second yeah, lap. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be in this race. Little did I know, <laughs> all that scribes around the right rear tire was going flat. Yeah, yeah. I lost that thing coming off turn Again? Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to the green. No, I'm, saying I'm coming to the, to the white yeah, flag. Yeah. That thing broke loose, and I hit the outside wall, down hit the inside wall, <laughs> tore that thing up. Destroyed another car. So this is two of DK's cars two that you that cars you've cars tried. I've destroyed. <laughs> okay. So uh, Daryl Daryl says, "Well, that was a dumb thing you did there, but you were really running good. <laughs> <laughs> Practice, you were really running really good." And I was said, uh, "Yeah, that's stupid. I didn't realize that it takes a long time for sound to travel a half a mile." I was yeah. thinking that he was lifting a lot sooner than it looked. <laughs> okay. So, you All know, right. I had this yeah. learning thing. And so, <laughs> so Daryl said, well, I think we, and I, I think we got together and said, we better get us a car and uh, do this ourselves. And uh, so Daryl said, if you want to, we'll, I'll try to hire a couple of people and we'll get us a place and find us a used car and, See if we can't go race. And uh, in the meantime, he worked out a deal with uh, 24, number 24. Cecil Gordon. Cecil Gordon. Yeah. To drive his car at uh, Riverside on the road course. Okay. It's going to be back then. It was before Daytona. You right. ran Riverside. Yeah. So we went out there to drive his car, got out there and ran it. It was running really good and motor blew up, but was – Getting with it. Of course, they're supposed to with the road course car. So, in the meantime, Daryl took this old used car we found. And we'd tried to go to the last race in 79. We went to Ontario for the last race of 79 with it. And I missed the race by one spot. Mm -hmm. Daryl said, you got to get you some more experience racing. He said, they're racing next weekend at Phoenix. They'll have a Winston West race. Why don't we just stay over and run that race? So we went out there, did that. The guy that we bought the car from took the car out there for us and you know, help us with it and whatever. The guy from Chicago <laughs> bought a car from Chicago, but it was an old Harry Hyde car. And the race at Phoenix started the race, ran the race. I'm running, I think I finished 15th. The first came time for the first pit stop. Uh, Daryl says, well, you're going to come in about two laps now. You'll be getting, get yourself ready to think about what you're doing and whatever. And as I'm getting ready to come down pit road, he says, don't come down. Don't come. Don't, don't come. Don't come. I said, what, 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 what's going on? He said, the guy's name was John. He said, John didn't buy any gas. He didn't think you'd last this long. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so, anyway, we finished 15th in the race. So uh, when we got back, Daryl cut a deal with, with Harry Hyde had built that car originally. It was a, one of his cars, original cars. And they, the guy was that he was taking care of cars for at that time, he had all his stuff done. They were ready to go, and they really didn't have anything going on. And Daryl said, would you overhaul this thing, go through it, and clean it up? Well, they did. Boy, and they made that thing look like a shiny new penny. They rebuilt the motor, car, everything. We So we go to Daytona with this piece. It was still one of the big 77 Monte Carlos when most of the people are running Oldsmobiles and Buicks, you know, whatever they were. So we get down there, qualified fifth, I think, if I remember right, in the ARCA race. They dropped the green flag. I went right through these guys, took the lead, led most of the race had everybody but one car a lap down the lap the one that was in the lap was the year, past year's champion arca champion yeah so he's just been hanging on the back of me and i've been dragging him the whole race 
at, at Daytona. At Daytona. Wow. Okay. The uh, go karts draft too, so I knew a lot about drafting. Okay. And these big cars draft a lot easier. Than <laughs> yeah. A lot okay. better. Yeah. So it, I took that big car and just went to the front with it. Nothing flat. So anyway, they had a huge wreck was just a few laps left in the race. And it looked like that old war movie they used to call, <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, I've forgotten the name of it. They used to have it back then. They'd be smoking cars and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And this, but there was cars still in the grass in the infield, you know, in the trioval, in the grass and stuff. Yeah. When we come around for the yellow flag, I mean, for the uh, white flag. So we're taking the white flag and the yellow, yellow and white flag and you got to race one. The race is one. All I got to do yeah. is not run out of gas and come back. Right. Well, there's debris all over the track, everywhere, stuff. Just stuff hadn't been cleaned up all the way, you know. So we come down, and they'd already told my pit crew to go to pit to go to Victory Lane. So we get to the entrance of Pit Road. And I look up there, and the guy's got a green and a checkered flag. They knew Holy that I had cow. run over. They knew that I had run over something and had cut a rear tire down because it was on the interliner. Well, I mean, it's fine to ride around. No big deal. But when you go full throttle, yeah, you only got one tire driving. Yeah. So the guy pulls out and passes me, and wins the race. They give him the race. So the the green flag was for like a few hundred yards. That's what. That's, that's what's not. That's it. That was it. The drag race. Really? Yeah. Did you ever get an explanation for why that was, or was that something that happened back then? Dick Brooks was one of the announcers. <laughs> I, I got oh, his, that's I got all his, you need to I say there. Him, I got his, <laughs> four stories. Dick has some real good comments. So well, if you want to later, I'll listen, let you listen to it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it was not what he said. I've been around racing a long time. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> He said there's going to be some hot people there in the garage here. Well, that's, uh, you know, they never finish under the, never, never let them finish under the yellow as long as you're racing for ARCA, I guess. <laughs> so, so they let them run at the end. I'll tell you, I know somebody over the pit's going to be mighty hot. But that was my introduction. Was I knew that I'd probably ruffle a lot of feathers, and uh, Daryl was kind of, he was really upset uh, that, I was getting getting that kind of treatment, you know, and having done so good. And uh, now, what had you done to ruffle feathers necessarily? I just, think just the crashing and like in okay. Atlanta, the deal yeah, Atlanta, yeah. acting a fool, you know, and <laughs> yeah, doing that, and then uh, that really would have been the only thing there. Okay, all right. And I probably not there not tell anything else. <laughs> It's just between anyway, me. It's was, just between some, me, you, and a few you know, thousand there's, listeners there's, or whatever. There's, there's some, you know, there's other issues, but not. You know, just stuff happens. So right. anyway, that yeah. was a that was a uh, cruel way to start out. Yeah, yeah. It would have been really cool if I'd won the race. <laughs> <laughs> won my first race at Daytona. 